All right, good morning, TBC family and friends. Also want to say a special welcome to any of our first-time guests. We are thrilled that you are with us, and we hope that you feel like you are at home. And so again, grateful that everyone is in the room. Also grateful for those engaged with us online. If you would take your scriptures and join me in the Gospel of Mark as we continue our teaching series, we're going to be in chapter, in chapter 1. You know, this time of year, like some of you, I spend my Friday nights in the stands watching football. Anybody else? That's where you spend your Friday nights. Right now, we're spending our Friday nights watching Texas high school football. There's nothing like it. And one of the exciting parts of a Friday night football game is when the team and the players, when they rush onto the field before the beginning of the game. And so kids sometimes and parents and teenagers, they're able to actually get on the field and they make a human tunnel while the players are kind of hidden behind what nowadays is an inflatable. But when I was in high school, the cheerleaders had to make these signs that would have kind of like a competitive message, like down with the dogs or something like that. And the players are hidden behind this sign or behind this inflatable. And then there comes this moment where the players break through that paper, they break through that inflatable and they run through the human total onto the sidelines and the game begins. It's in a very exciting moment. For a lot of us dads, it's like we want to actually suit up and get, get back out there like we did in our glory days. But it's this moment of like breakthrough. And what we're going to see in the story this morning as we read, we're going to see that Jesus announces that the kingdom of God is breaking through. And we find this in verse 14 of Mark chapter one. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Meaning the king has come. And those part of the kingdom of God are called to repent and believe in the gospel. And as we continue reading, we're gonna get a picture of repenting and believing in verse 16. And passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed Jesus. Let us pray. And so our Father in heaven, we pray that you would open our eyes to see, that you would open up our ears to hear, and you would open up our hearts to receive wonderful truth from your word. And all God's people said together, Amen. And so we find Jesus in Galilee, which is the northern region of Palestine. And he's walking alongside this beautiful sea called the Sea of Galilee. And on any given day, there were hundreds of fishermen trying to make a living fishing in the sea. And even though there were hundreds of fishermen on this day, Jesus is going to just single out a few. And he's going to offer them an invitation and friends, we're gonna see this is not an invita invitation to simply make a decision. The late Eugene Peterson says this, millions of people in our culture make decisions for Christ, but there is a dreadful attrition rate. He continues and, say, and writes, many claim to have been born again, but the evidence of mature Christian discipleship is slim. You see, friends, Jesus' invitation to follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. It's not simply an opportunity to make a decision, but it is an opportunity to be his disciple, to follow after him as a student and as his servant. And these four fishermen, they say, yes. They say, yes. Yes. And so just picture the scene. There are these fishermen. And one of them is casting a net. The other one, maybe they're cleaning the net. And they're there. And they are familiar with Jesus. 
They have seen him. And they're there with a net similar to this. And as they're cleaning their nets, as they're getting ready to cast their nets, they hear this man say, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And these two sets of brothers, Simon and Andrew and James and John, their responses are identical. Immediate obedience. The scripture says that they leave their nets And Mark tells us that a couple of the brothers, they leave their dad in the boat, (laughs) which I'm thinking, that would hurt my feelings, I think. But they leave their dad in the boat and they begin to follow Jesus. And so in this story, we see the kingdom of God is breaking through and we see these brothers break with their livelihood to follow Jesus. And so the question for us this morning is what are we holding on to? What are we clinging to that we need to let go of so that we can follow Jesus? And so these brothers, they let go of their nets and they follow Jesus. Have you ever thought about what it would have been like to follow Jesus? You ever wondered what it would have been like a a day in the life of a disciple of Jesus. Well, as we continue to see in this story, we're going to get a picture of what it was like for these disciples to to be with Jesus in a 24-hour span. And we're gonna see that first, they find themselves in the synagogue with Jesus. Jesus is in the town of Capernaum and he's there and it's the Sabbath. It's Saturday. Saturday. And they make their way into the synagogue and students, the synagogue was a place of prayer and a place of teaching. And so Jesus was likely invited to teach. And so Jesus is in the synagogue and he begins teaching and people are in awe of his teaching. And then suddenly in the synagogue, there is a man with an unclean spirit causing a commotion in the synagogue. And the unclean spirit says this to Jesus, Are you going to destroy us? Now, if you are in a fight and you have to say to your opponent, are you going to destroy us? It's probably not gonna be a good day for you. Are you going to destroy us, Jesus? The Holy One of Israel, the demon says. And then Jesus says he rebukes the evil spirit and he says, be silent and come out of him. Now, be silent is really strong and it's very direct. It could read, be muzzled. That's literally what Jesus said. Be muzzled. Again, it's a very strong and very direct phrase. And if I was going to say it in today's term, It's a word that we don't say in our home and I would imagine you don't say in your home, but just bear with me to try to capture this moment. If you were to put it in our terms today, Jesus would have said this evil spirit, shut up and get out of him. And immediately the evil spirit causes a commotion with a scream and we read, he leaves the man. And we find out in the gospel of Luke, Jesus tells us why he cast out demons. Luke writes this, but if it is by the finger of God that I, Jesus, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Again, the kingdom of God is breaking through. And Jesus continues teaching in the synagogue and he continues to teach the crowd listening to Jesus, they are amazed. The word says that they are in awe and reverence. There's a bit of a a fear now as they've watched Jesus teach with this newfound authority and they've watched him cast out this demon. There's a awe and a reverence that these people are experiencing as they watch Jesus in action, as they watch the kingdom of God breaking through. And this episode ends with Jesus' fame beginning to spread. But then we see in episode two, 
we see that Jesus immediately goes to the house of Simon and Andrew. And when they get there, Jesus learns from the disciples that Simon's mother-in-law is ill. And when Jesus hears that, I love this picture of Jesus. The scripture says that he goes to her and he took her by the hand and lifted her up and her fever leaves. And she begins serving the disciples. And so in episode one, when Jesus is in the synagogue, we see his authority. And now in episode two, in the home of Peter, we see Jesus's compassion. And if we keep reading, we'll see that episode three takes place outside the house. It's the evening around six o'clock and the crowds have heard about the previous miracle where Jesus cast out the demon. And so now the crowd, the city begins to come to Peter's home and they're standing outside of Peter's house. They're looking for Jesus because they have friends and parents. They have children that need to be healed. And the scripture says that Jesus begins healing the sick and he begins casting out demons. And again, we see Jesus's compassion over and over and over as he touches the sick and as he casts out demons. Jesus's compassion is on display. It's especially on display. If you go look at the end of Mark chapter one, you're going to see that there is a leper that runs towards Jesus. And that was a no-no if you were a leper. A leper was someone who had a major skin disease. They had to live alone according to the law and they had to live outside the city according to the law. And if you were a leper, if you got close to your friends, if you got close to your family, you would have to shout out, unclean, unclean, so that they could scramble so that they would not become unclean. And so here is this leper his whole life. He's had to yell unclean. He's had to live alone and he's had to live outside the city. And he sees Jesus and he makes a beeline for him. And just like Jesus reached out his hand and touched Simon's mother-in-law, Jesus extends his hand and he stretches out his hand to this leper and he heals him. We see Jesus' compassion. And when you read the story, you'll see that Jesus tells these demons after he casts them out, he says to be silent. And he does that because he has things to teach his disciples. And so he's trying to stay kind of hidden, if you will. But the word continues to spread as Jesus heals the sick and as he casts out demons. Over and over and over, we see the compassion of Jesus. And as the day comes to a close, the disciples are going to learn several things. As they've observed and as they've witnessed Jesus, as they've followed after him, they're going to see that ministry can happen anywhere at any time. They're gonna learn this. They're also gonna learn that ministry is not neat and tidy. It's messy and unexpected but they're especially going to learn that Jesus is not put off and he is not afraid and he is not too busy for messy situations, which means he's not too busy. He's not afraid and he's not put off by our messy situations. But these are the lessons the disciples learn as the day draws near. But then we see episode four. We read that Jesus rising very early, maybe around 4 a.m. And I know some of you are thinking, Eric, don't ask me to get up at 4 a.m. It says that Jesus rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and he went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. So again, picture the scene. Here is Jesus. The day before, he has been very busy preaching and teaching, healing and casting out demons. He gets a little bit of a rest, but he rises early in the morning. 
sneaks out of the city to a lonely place and he prays. And this does not go over well for Simon and some of the others. We read that, that Simon and some of the others, they become anxious and they start searching for Jesus and they cannot find him. And so maybe they're thinking, oh goodness, Jesus has left us. And so they begin searching for him and finally Simon finds him and he says, Jesus, everybody's looking for you. There are people to heal. There are demons to cast out. There are sermons to preach. Jesus, there are people waiting for you. There are people that need you. Where have you been? So there's this angst from Simon and the others. And Jesus responds with these words. And he said to them, let us go. And so Simon is hearing, letting us go. And Simon's saying, well, let's go back in the city so you can heal, so you can cast out demons, so you can preach. And Jesus says, no. Let us go to the next towns. Wait, what? I can just picture Simon. He's kind of bold. He's a little bit arrogant. He, to the next towns, don't you know all the ministry that has to happen? And then Jesus says that I may preach there also for that is why I came out. This is the mission of Jesus. It's what we would call of first importance. Jesus's mission was to preach that the kingdom of God was near. Therefore, repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus says, this is why I came, to preach. And so we've seen his authority, we've seen his compassion, and now the disciples see his mission to preach. And then episode five, the disciples follow him and Jesus continues to preaching in the surrounding regions we read, and he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And so in a 24 hour span, the disciples witnessed the kingdom of God breaking through as Jesus was preaching, as he was healing the sick, and as he was casting out demons. They had a eyewitness account to the kingdom of God breaking through. But they also witnessed a rhythm in Jesus's life that I think surprised them. It especially surprised Simon. They see this rhythm in Jesus's life and it's this rhythm of retreating to re-enter. Look with me back at verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, now remember Jesus the night before, the day before, he'd been ministering and healing and preaching and casting out demons and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. There he prayed. One of my neighbors sent me a text last Sunday afternoon and he asked me to water a certain section of his yard a couple of weeks prior, he had laid down some Bermuda in the backyard, an entire pallet worth. And they were off on vacation. And so he sent me a text last Sunday, said, would you mind turning on the sprinklers and running the sprinklers for me while, while we're out of town? And this is the kind of neighbor that does a lot for me. And so I'm obviously, yes, sir, I'd be glad to. And so Sunday evening, as I was taking my dog for a walk, I stopped by his house turned on the water and I went for a walk with my dog and made one lap. And then I made a second lap and I went inside my house. And so I'm blaming this on my dog, by the way. <laughs> I went to sleep Sunday night. Woke up Monday morning and you know that feeling that you have when you start sweating because you know you've done something that you shouldn't have done 
or you haven't done something that you should have done. I throw my tennis shoes on and I run over to my neighbor's yard and I turn off that water and I'm like, oh my goodness, he's on vacation. Do I ruin his vacation and just tell him that I've let his sprinklers run for about 12 hours? I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. So my neighbor arrived home last night and we're sitting on the back patio having a family dinner and I told my boys, I was like, y'all need to go tell him y'all left his water running all night long. <laughs> I still haven't told him, by the way, <laughs> but I will. And so the sprinklers were running and running and running, and eventually the bill's going to come, <laughs> or he's going to get a letter saying, you have exceeded the amount of water you should be using, and so here's a fine. And eventually the bill or the penalty is going to come and damage is going to be done. And it got me thinking. How many of us are running and running and running and running and running? And we can't think of the last time it's been since we've taken a retreat. We can't think of a time where we've taken a step back to take a breather. And we run and we run and we run and we run. And eventually the bill is going to come or the penalty is gonna come and the damage is gonna be done because we failed to follow the example of Jesus in taking time to retreat before we re-enter. And I think Mark wants us to see that Jesus was intentional, yes, about ministry, but he was also intentional about spending time with God. When you look at this verse, there are four verbs. It says that he got up, he rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed, he went out and he prayed. I think Mark writes the story this way because he wants us to see the resolve that Jesus has when it comes to getting alone, picking a time, picking a place to spend time with the Father. I think Mark wants us to see that is that Jesus had this commitment. Jesus had this rhythm that the disciples are likely seeing for the first time here and they'll see it later on as we continue in the story. But they see Jesus taking time to retreat before he re-enters ministry. And if the son of God needs to retreat to be refueled and refreshed, don't his followers but for some of us, we just keep running and running and running and running until it's too late. Jesus was busy. I'm not saying I've ever been as busy as Jesus, but as I read the story of him praying and teaching and healing and ministering to people, it reminded me of a season in, in my life that, that I may have just experienced a glimpse of what Jesus experienced. And it was in 2020 when we went to India. We went to this village and we had a worship gathering. And after the worship gathering, they let the citizens of this village know that, hey, we have some people that are gonna pray for you. And I don't know how long, but we stood there and we prayed over people. And we spoke blessing over people. We prayed for diseases and illnesses. And we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And it was one of those things, it was such an honor and privilege, but it was exhausting. And I would imagine this is how Jesus felt. He had been teaching and preaching and healing the sick and casting out demons. He had been running and running and running. There's a story later on in the gospel where Jesus heals someone and he, he feels the power leave his body, meaning when Jesus was performing these miracles and when he was doing this teaching, it was taking a toll on him. He needed a time to be recharged and refreshed. And here, as he begins his ministry, he gets up early and he leaves the city. He finds a place and he prays. And I'm thinking if this is a habit of Jesus, it should be a habit of ours as well. And so do you have a time and do you have a place 
that you can go retreat with God. David Mathis writes this. The healthy Christian life is neither wholly solitary nor wholly communal. We withdraw like Jesus to a desolate place to commune with God and then return to the bustle of daily tasks and the needs of others. We carve out a season for spiritual respite to feed our souls and join God there in the stillness. Then we enter back and as a light and bread to a hungry, harassed, and helpless world. And so friends, if I can just ask you and myself, where is the time and the place that I retreat to spend time and commune with God and in order to be refreshed and renewed to re-enter the ministry he has? And so that's the invitation that's partly what it looks like to follow Jesus, to have a rhythm of retreating and then re-entering the work he has for us to do. Would you please stand with me as we take a moment to pray? If you wouldn't mind just bowing your heads and closing your eyes just for a moment, I just feel led to do this again. So again, with just your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if, if it's been some time since you have spent time alone with God, and as you have listened and read the story of Jesus and how he took time to retreat, as you've witnessed and watched Jesus' life and his habits this morning, if you would say, Pastor, I, I, I need to get in that rhythm. It's been a while and I need to get into that rhythm. I've been running and running and running and I need to adopt into my life a time of retreating. If you would like prayer, would you just slightly raise your hand for me? Thank you, thank you, amen. Thank you, I see your hands. Well, I just want you to know you're not alone because my hand is raised too. So as I pray for you, I also pray for myself and let us do that. And so our great God and loving Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it is living and active and how it does a work in us even today. That it is timeless and true. And so spirit of the living God, would you do a work in our hearts this morning in our minds this morning. For those of us who confess that it's been some time since we've retreated with you, would you encourage us? Would you encourage us to pick a time and a place to meet with you, to retreat, to be refreshed and to be renewed and then to re-enter the ministry that you have for us. And so Spirit, would you minister to your people this morning? And Father, as a church, we wanna follow the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so if there is something that we need to let go of, if there's a net that we need to drop this morning, may we drop it and may we immediately obey you this morning. May we follow you. And lastly, we thank you that you initiated this relationship, that you're the one that says, come follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And say thank you for initiating and thank you for promising to make us more and more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.